Okay, so I'm going to give a talk today on the, um, go back one slide, on the uh, DHHS guidelines. There we go. Antiretroviral therapy guidelines. This is a pretty big topic, and I'm just going to really hit the highlights here. Um, there we go. So there's two basic questions that we talk about that the guidelines hit, and the highlights really are when to start therapy and what to start. So I'm going to hit on both of those, and then at the end talk about a couple special populations. And I'm mainly going to focus on these DHHS guidelines, which are really a collaboration between the CDC and the NIH and the FDA, and kind of all of our, all of our national experts that, that really drives most of prescribing policy in our country. I do want you to be aware of a second set of guidelines, however, called the IAS USA guidelines that were last published in July 2010, which differ in subtle ways uh, that are important to know about. And then I'm just going to really gloss over the supporting evidence base. So this is a document here, last published in October uh, 2011. This is constantly being updated, and really the best source is to go straight to the website, aidsinfo.nih.gov, because when they do make in, uh, interval changes, they update them on the, on the web-only document. I want to frame this discussion really in the context of the lifespan of untreated HIV. And as we all know, when the CD4 count gets below 200, that's when really opportunistic infections start causing a lot of problems. But a lot of the um, discussion here has moved in towards more of the uh, 500 down to 200 cell range, and where is the optimal time to start mm -hmm. therapy in this range? We're now aware of a lot of more complications that are not necessarily AIDS-defining illnesses um, that probably benefit from antiretroviral therapy in this range. So a lot of the debate has been uh, surrounding 500 to 200 range. As you can see through time, these recommendations really have changed at where, where the therapy is recommended. Back in 2003, we were waiting for people to technically develop AIDS and or AIDS-defining illnesses before we started therapy. And there were certainly reasons for this. The therapies were much harder to take, much more toxic, and we didn't have as many second-line options. But since that time, uh, there's been a lot of drug development, and as you can see, the line in the sand that we've drawn uh, where therapy is recommended has moved up to two, 350 in 2007, and then since 2009, it's been at 500. So I'm going to cut straight to the chase here. The, the recommended thresholds here in the most recent publication in October 2011 are here. So 500 cells and below is where therapy is recommended, and then 350 cells and below is, is where therapy is strongly recommended. And above 500, you can see that they even allow consideration of antiretroviral therapy depending on the patient. When you get into some of the details, of this document, the panels, the expert panels, were not really unanimous. So you can see that in the recommend category between 350 and 500, there was some disagreement about how strongly we should recommend, and that's really based on the quality of the evidence. Similarly, in the greater than 500 CD4 cell group, uh, many experts really feel like we should be offering therapy, and so about half the panel favored offering therapy at any CD4 cell count. It's important to remember there are conditions for which the CD4 cell count really doesn't matter, and it will not drive your, your, your decision on when to treat. And those four decisions are here. They're great things to ask your students and residents on rounds. Uh, but any clinical AIDS-defining illness, um, sometimes these develop at higher CD4 counts, such as Kaposi sarcoma. That would be an indication for therapy. Any pregnant woman, um, really in our guidelines, you don't care about the CD4 cell count. You're, you're treating really to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Any patient with chronic hepatitis B infection for which the hepatitis B infection must be treated, that's a situation to start antiretroviral therapy. And then the last is HIVAN, or HIV-associated nephropathy. Treatment is recommended for all of those patients, regardless of CD4 count. So to summarize here, uh, on, on the basis of CD4 cell count, it is strongly recommended to start at 350 and below, and it is moderately recommended to start between 350 and 500. And then in these guidelines, um, there is consideration to treating all patients regardless of CD4 count in that above 500 category. And don't forget those four additional um, conditions here on the bottom where treatment is recommended regardless of CD4 cell count. And what you see on this page also is the, the evidence rating behind all these. And the reason that there is such a discussion and spirited argument is that some of these things have better evidence than others. And you can see that A1 would be a randomized controlled trial showing benefit. And anything less than that, it would be observational data. And many believe that, that the gold standard for recommendations like this would be randomized controlled trials. 
So the other recommendations that are, that are out there, in our country at least, are these that were published in JAMA in 2010. And this is just a different panel of experts. You can see the authors there. Uh, no pharmaceutical uh, money, and this was all done on a volunteer basis. And these differ in, in a couple of important but subtle ways. The first is that they really just draw one line, which is 500 and below, and recommend therapy for all patients below 500, acknowledging the fact that the evidence level is a little bit different between, between the 350 and below and the 500 and below. And they also have a consider, consider recommendation for those with CD4 cell counts above 500. Now, where the recommendations get a little different here is the other conditions for which therapy is recommended. So you can see this list is a lot longer than the four on the DHHS guidelines. So you do see symptomatic HIV or AIDS-defining illness. You see high band here. You see hepatitis B. And you see pregnancy as well. However, additional things here, high viral load above 100,000, rapid CD4 decline more than 100 cells per year, hepatitis C made it on their list, active cardiovascular disease or risk for cardiovascular disease, primary HIV infection that's symptomatic, uh, older age, or a high risk for secondary transmission, which I read to be a serodiscordant relationship. So kind of a pushing the envelope a little bit more in these guidelines as to who should qualify for therapy. And so here's the summary of the IAS USA guidelines. Really, all of these specific conditions, uh, it's kind of looking for a reason why not to treat your patient more than the other way around. And then if, it, if you're relying back on CD4 cell count, um, it's more just a recommend below 500 with slightly different evidence levels, and then consider above 500. I don't have time today to go through all of the evidence on which this is based, but I'm just going to highlight here a couple of trials. Uh, the NA Accord trial here is really, I think, the main driver for why in 2009 we went up to 500. And that was a large observational trial of a kind of a cohort of cohorts in North America. <laughs> and in two separate analyses, they showed a 69% decrease in mortality or a 94% decrease in mortality, depending on where they cut off the CD4 cells there. And so although it's observational data, really drove the, the guidelines committee to push up to 500 cells. The most recent uh, piece of evidence here, which I don't think has really been incorporated in the guidelines, is the HPTN052 trial, which I think um, was referred to earlier really a large international randomized controlled trial showing the benefits of treatment in terms of prevention. And so there was a 96% decrease in transmission in, in serodiscordant partnerships here uh, within this study. So I think the guideline committees are going to really consider this when uh, the next iteration is, is done. So moving on to what to start uh, for the second part of the talk, we're going to talk about really treatment-naive patients um, and then a couple of um, words about some of the newer agents. So as I think all of you know, we've got five classes of antiretroviral drugs now. These are the three original ones. And then lately in the last five years or so, we've had integrase inhibitors and uh, entry inhibitors developed. And when you put all these together, we're up to about 30 individual agents. Um, our chart is being updated currently with the, the latest um, on the scene, which is real pivoting down here, co-formulated with m tricytamine tenofovir as Complera. And uh, people get overwhelmed when I give talks and show this chart because it's a <laughs> lot of, of words, uh, a lot of vocabulary, a lot of drug names. And of course, each of them has two, two names and then a three-letter code. Uh, and I never show this to patients unless I'm trying to identify things because it's really a lot, a lot to look at. But the reality is that uh, things are much more simple than, than this chart uh, allows. This is what we do mainly for salvage regimens. But the guidelines suggest really a pretty simplistic approach of how to put together a first-line agent. There is a backbone that's used that is a, basically a dual NRTI regimen. And in, in the case I'll show you in a second, this is only one pill that we're really down to. And on top of that backbone, you add one of three agents, either a, an NNRTI, which is a Favarins in this case, either a protease inhibitor, adizanivir, or darunavir, and that's usually ritonavir boosted. Or the third choice would be an integrase strand inhibitor or raltegravir. What that looks like in reality is here on the next slide, Truvada is really going to be the dual NRTI of choice. This used to be more than just one pill, but, but the evidence has accumulated to show that Truvada is really the, the best agent to start with. And then if you're going to add an NNRTI onto that, it conveniently comes in one pill. That's called a tripla or Truvada, or sorry, Tadafavir, m tricytamine, and a if you're going to add a protease inhibitor regimen, this is what it looks like here, either adizanivir boosted with ritonavir or darunavir boosted with ritonavir. Those are all once daily regimens. And the last regimen is this raltegravir regimen on the end. The only disadvantage there is that it's a twice a day regimen or BID. 
So just to put that in tabular form, uh, that's what this looks like here. Really just four choices for your treatment-naive patient, and uh, it's really a matter of just going what the risks and benefits of each different regimen are, whether there's pre-existing drug resistance um, to help you narrow down your choices. So now the guidelines talk a lot about all these alternative regimens and then acceptable regimens. And so here you can see some of the newer agents. And what happens here is that as the evidence from clinical trials accumulates, things get moved around. And the new kid on the block here is real pivorine. At this point, it's basically an alternative <coughs> regimen. It is not made, made it into the top four of preferred regimens, mainly due to increased virologic failure at high viral loads. But these are going to be alternative regimens, different combinations you can see here. For example, rotegravir with a bacavir lamivudine, which is not as good evidence and, and not in the preferred range, but probably an acceptable regimen if for some reason you couldn't use one of the preferred agents. Uh, lastly, there's acceptable regimens here, which have some data supporting them. This is where things like Maraviroc show up. Maraviroc really not in the preferred starting uh, group, but it, it has been studied in this context, so it shows up as an acceptable regi regimen. There's another list I'm not going to show you, which is regimens to avoid due to drug interactions or combined toxicities. <clears throat> I'm going to finish up just with a couple of words about special populations. We'll have different uh, mini didactics on these issues themselves, but just to cover briefly, the DHHS guidelines talk about these issues, um, the first being acute HIV infection. Should you offer treatment in somebody that has acute <coughs> HIV infection? And they really kind of hedge their wording here. The benefit is unknown for treating acute HIV infection, and it should be considered optional. The, the situation where that is not true at all is a pregnant woman. An acute HIV infection in a pregnant woman I would consider kind of an emergency because the risk of transmission to the baby is very high. Um, if you do decide to offer therapy in acute HIV infection, a ritonavir-boosted PI regimen is preferred, especially if you're waiting for the drug resistance test. Secondly, pregnancy is really a completely different situation. All pregnant women in our country should be offered uh, antiretroviral therapy regardless of CD4 count, and you're not only benefiting the mother, you're really trying to prevent perinatal transmission, and very good evidence for that. Uh, the regimens to start in pregnant women are very different uh, with Kaletra or um, lopinavir, ritonavir, as well as combivir or zidavidine, lamivudine being preferred mainly because of the long safety record that we have with these agents dating back to the 90s in pregnant women. And lastly, there are two special situations that are commented on in the guidelines, what to do in the face of an opportunistic infection and what to do with tuberculosis. And these are very long discussions I don't have time to go through, but just suffice to say that certain opportunistic infections, really heart is your only treatment, so such as cryptosporidiosis, PML, or microsporidiosis. Um, some OIs have a high potential for immune reconstitution and inflammatory syndrome, and, the, and antiretroviral therapy should be started cautiously for those, cryptococcus being the main culprit here. And then in the other sort of general OIs, such as pneumocystis pneumonia, we know that uh, starting ART early or within two weeks is actually beneficial, and so ART should not be delayed in this situation. Lastly, tuberculosis. Everybody that has, um, regardless of CD4 count, everybody should start tuberculosis therapy immediately, and the question is really when to begin ART in this context, and uh, I think Dr. Behrens is going to give a talk about this. Um, there is a, a robust set of literature, three main papers, the Camellia trial, the STRIDE trial, and the SAPIT trial, which have really given us a lot of information of what to do here. And the bottom line is kind of here, depending on CD4 count, start within either two to four weeks of starting TB treatment, or if they have high CD4 cell counts, start uh, within eight weeks. So I'll summarize here. We talked about when to start, and both the DHHS and ISUSA guidelines recommend starting at or below a threshold of 500 cells. 500 CD4 cells, a treatment above this level is optional, and I would say in a motivated patient, I still offer it above 500 cells. Secondly, what to start? This has gotten a lot, a lot more simple because of our data that we have now. Uh, basically, we use a backbone of m and tenofovir, which is combined in a single pill as Truvada, and on top of that, we add a third agent, such as efavirenz, one of the two protease inhibitors, adazanavir, ritonavir, or darunavir, ritonavir, or rotegravir containing regimen. And it's really a discussion between uh, the provider and the patient as to which of those is best uh, for that individual patient. The role of newly approved agents such as rilpivirine is constantly evolving, and these bounce around um, from being alternative, acceptable, or preferred regimens. We just have to pay attention to the <coughs> latest guidelines. And lastly, I'll say that special populations really take special consideration. Firstly, all pregnant women need to start ART really as soon as possible to prevent vertical transmission. 
Uh, and secondly, ART in the setting of special situations like primary HIV infection, acute opportunistic infection, or tuberculosis is a complex decision and, and really evolving based on the evidence, as is the case with tuberculosis. Uh, so I'll stop there and open it up for questions just for a couple of minutes.